learned people on the subject from whom we are to hear on the rest of the session and all of you ladies and gentlemen. There's a place when ministers should speak and there's a place when they should listen. And something like innovation in deep tech and AI, there's not really that much for ministers to speak. So I'll try and keep my comments brief so we can get more time with the experts. As the secretary said, in some sense, this is the nth coming of AI, the third or the fourth. I remember Deep Blue, I remember the chatbots. Uh, I'm old enough to have seen many of these come and go. But what I think makes it different this time, other than the obvious results we see and the quality of the content generated through the generative AI, is that we have such vast amounts of data already available, at least in some languages in some countries, and the possibilities that that kind of data can be created and stored at relatively you know, marginal cost of zero, and therefore that the available content for a machine to learn, for a program to learn, is infinite. Combined with the fact that these days, access to really high levels of computing power is quite democratized through the cloud. And even startups for short periods of time can harness huge amounts of computing power at some reasonable cost. What would otherwise cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build regularly can be hired for an hour or a day. I think the combination of these has really unleashed the creativity and the whole approach to how machines and human beings interact. I say many times that my PhD dissertation back in 1990 or 91 was about understanding human cognition and helping to design computer interfaces with that understanding. That is to say, we want to try and make the machine more accessible to the person. And that was the extent of computing power at that time, the average person, the one that doesn't need to be a specialist. We have reached the other end of that spectrum today where we are training the machines how to be like humans. And we now have the capability of doing that. Obviously, that opens up a whole lot of possibilities. And to touch upon briefly the nature of this double-edged kind of evolution, a, in job creation versus job destruction. I think clearly many jobs that were done by human beings will be much, much better and faster done and more reliably done by these machines. In my old industry of banking, the amount of work that was done post the mainframe processing of all the reported transactions that required hundreds of human beings to do, uh, AI can probably eliminate all those jobs altogether. And yet, the creation of the content and the creation of the machine learning programming in English language or in our case in Tamil language and in the regional languages is going to create a whole lot of new jobs that we have not had before and provide the possibility of even leapfrogging were we to have the right ecosystem to foster that kind of innovation. Of course, we also see that as much as generative can replace human beings, you can also do a lot of deep fakes. And so authentication of content and origination of source is going to be very important. We have seen election manipulation in many countries through uh, AI level of deep fakes and content manipulation. Somebody gifted me a book and I was just reading it uh, earlier about how in the Russia-Ukraine war, the battle for Kiev was effectively won by a bunch of programmers who got a bunch of drones together and were able to go and bomb out the advanced parts of a 40 kilometer long convoy of uh, Russian vehicles in such a way that the entire road was blocked and effectively changed what was otherwise sure defeat into eventual withdrawal of the Russian forces because then they used the same technology to go and bomb out the supply chain. And so the, you, you had troops stuck with no way to go forward and not enough supplies to stay where they were. So this is the disruptive power, because what they could do is train these drones based on some of the camouflage they had detected to identify where other likely camouflaged uh, vehicles and supplies were. So you look at all of this together, and I think this is going to be 
surely one of those inflection points uh, in my career, I've seen two or three of these, uh, the widespread advent of converting analog and digital signals which led to the ERP revolution and the automation of factories, the internet and email which led to a different kind of connectivity, the internet of things which led to a different level of automation and efficiency. And this is probably even more impactful than all of that together. As far as the government is concerned, I would say broadly there are three areas we're focused on when it comes to deep tech and AI. The first and by far the most important to somebody like me who comes from a social justice philosophy and the equity and inclusion agenda to public life is that we can change the way government functions. We can remove a lot of the human elements and the disruption that bad human elements can create in processes. And we should be able to make it so inclusive that even the lowest level of education with voice interaction should be able to get resolution of their requests or needs from the government without having to worry about you know, running from pillar to post and seeing 10 different officers. So the way government functions and the way government interacts with citizens, we hope will be our primary target for where we can apply these kinds of technologies and improve. Of course, part of government's job is to facilitate or create that kind of ecosystem where entrepreneurs and creative people can facilitate growth and, and help grow the, uh, the employment, which is so vital for us as we reap our demographic dividend. And I think in the case of Tamil Nadu, where we have fallen a bit behind other states or other cities, at least in perception and branding, uh, this technology and this paradigm shift offers us the opportunity to leapfrog some of the more traditional players and create a center of excellence or an ecosystem of excellence, not even a center, around AI and deep tech in Tamil Nadu and use that and the brilliant uh, and very talented and the huge magnitude of engineers and, and scientists that Tamil Nadu graduates every year to actually leverage the benefits of our education system and get jobs and growth. And then of course, though it's very hard for states to regulate things at a you know, technological level, it's an international business in some sense, it's a national policy making, but to have inputs uh, in our own way into the regulation and responsible use of such technologies and to have uh, our uh, responsible, um, you know, our, our duties to the citizens properly uh, input through these technologies, especially as we fear about the quality of democracy deteriorating in general. So I think with those objectives, uh, I'm here to learn as much as everybody else, and so I won't say much more. Uh, it's a very exciting time uh, for us, for the world, for the technology, for the young people, and I hope that in the next uh, 75 minutes or so, we'll all come away from this uh, much more enlightened and with a lot of uh, thought-provoking inputs. And I thank you once again for coming. Thank you. Hi, sir. Such a pleasure seeing you today. I'm Samir Kudur from the U.S. India Business Council. My question to you is, uh, as you know, India today holds a presidency for the Global Partnership on AI. So how big is the role of the states in discussions around GPA presidency? And uh, what are the things, as far as regional languages are concerned, that you can perhaps put across to the central government in order to, like, you know, incorporate these ideas? I must confess that we have at least not officially had any interaction yet with the government of India, so it's news to me. What you're telling me is news to me. Uh, of course, we have some of our very fine officers now serving in, in Delhi and in, uh, in, among others, my old finance secretary, Mr. Krishnan, is the Métis secretary. So we'll follow up with him. I, I don't have any insight yet. But I will say that part of the issue with uh, regional languages is that the data set and the uh, existing engines in English are so far advanced that it's going to take a bit of work for us. I mean, we have lots of people, we have a lot of history of the language, we have lots of data as a government, but to get all these into a digitized, machine learnable, and in many cases, voice learnable format is probably going to be one of the big uh, manual tasks, or, and then even that some can be automated. I've been looking at technologies for that. But to create those data sets 
will be the basis for getting that level of sophistication that now exists in English into the regional languages and it's our job to do that because we all want to preserve our mother tongue and our language. Hello. So, so follow-up question on that. Uh, is Tamil Nadu government taking any uh, proactive measures uh, here on your left? So is Tamil Nadu government taking any proactive measures? Uh, there are some uh, instances of small startups leveraging. Uh, also, there are uh, challenges, uh, concerns raised by the technologists. They say that the inscription or the, the you know, uh, the way the Tamil is uh, in the internet, it is not easily be uh, encoded into this machine language algorithms uh, or what you call that in tokens. So, uh, is Tamil Nadu government talking on any of these areas? Yeah, I think uh, we are broadly in the process of uh, coming up with some uh, incentive and, and support policies in the, uh, in the IT, uh, overall IT space and certainly as the IT and T CEO mentioned around specific areas like AI. Uh, hopefully it's sooner rather than later. I must confess that the previous IT policy which has been around for five or six years, five years, has not had any takers. So something is clearly wrong in the way that our uh, incentive policies were set up, despite the fact that we have seen phenomenal growth. As many of you know, last year, Chennai's office uptake was double the uh, annual average of the last few years before that. So something is a bit off in the way we are setting up these policies. We'll, we'll figure out. But in the case of AI companies, I think really it's about access to data, access to computing power, and then you know, the, the basics of anybody else to have a startup space, to have power, to have uh, decent, uh, you know, infrastructure. The second question I think is a bit more complex. Already there's an issue, Tamil Nadu was uh, one of the early members in the UU Code Consortium and we had been moving to come up with uh, all the Tamil text to be machine readable and translatable uh, because of being compliant with UU Code for various reasons, and I don't want to talk politically here, but for various reasons that was not quite done and a lot of proprietary codes were used and a proprietary fonts were used. And so we have a lot of problems at least with government content that needs to be fixed. But there's a very clear solution, right? If they're all uh, universal code, they can be translated easily and machine read easily and can the machine learning can be programmed easily. So the more we move towards the standard code, uh, fonts, uh, then I think we'll be better off. We had to do that for other reasons anyway. We'll probably push even harder now for these reasons. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Sir, on, uh, here, on your left. Uh, uh, this will be the last I, I, question. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'm sophisticated enough to answer a lot of questions. Why don't we get the experts here? So anyway. Yes, the last yeah, question. I'll yeah, keep it short. Yeah. Sir. First of all, big fan. And uh, we've read about how open, open AI uses a lot of water in its data centers. So if India were to, you know, develop one of its own and given the water shortages in the country and especially in a state like Tamil Nadu where we have faced a lot of water problems and like water-based disasters, how would the government go about handling those kind of situations? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that AI data centers are going to consume a lot more water than generic data centers. Maybe I'm not well informed, but I think we have a broader problem uh, which is, and I, I'll just take a crack at this uh, without enough real depth. One is that data center power and water supply in general, I think, needs to be looked at both from, uh, you know, clean energy as well as uh, our overall water utilization is very, very inefficient. Even if you take advanced countries, the amount of recycling they do and the amount of uh, kind of, you know, multi-use, multi reuse, we don't do much of that at all. So our long-term solution has to be not that there's shortage of water, as many of you can tell, is that we don't store it, we don't recycle it, we don't. So we got, we got a structural problem. I'm not sure it's unique for data centers. Data centers, I think, is more uh, important to us for other reasons. But I think uh, the cooling technology also is changing quite a bit. I've started to see a lot more air-cooled rather than water-cooled, and there's some, you know, in, in efficiencies in the design. So I think the broader perspective, at least from government of Tamil Nadu's uh, view, is that we want renewable 
uh, energy and reusable cooling uh, systems uh, with, with a lot of uh, recycling cooling systems and that will be true for data centers as much as is true for any other you know purpose and certainly I don't think we have a separate policy for AI data centers compared to gen data centers in general. I'm Gopi Balasubramaniam. I'm a CEO of a German startup uh, working on quantum computation. Um, my, my question is, I mean, quantum computing is a deep tech technology, and as you know, Europe and other Western countries have export regulations and restrictions. How does India and Tamil Nadu plan to tackle this um, in this context, uh, in this context? Thank you. I can only give you one instance because I don't know about India. Uh, actually, I can say two things. One, the government of India has sponsored two uh, quantum computing centers. I'm not sure that's actually buying computing power, but maybe to innovate around quantum computing. One has already been allocated to the Northeast. Uh, I'm in talks with the government of India to get the other one allocated to Tamil Nadu. Hopefully, they will. You know, it's a, it's a natural, logical choice, but we will never know. Um, the other uh, aspect is that one of the countries that does particularly well in uh, building quantum computers, as you may know, is Finland, you know, because of their old engineering uh, prowess and so forth. So actually we are in discussions with them uh, for a few months now. Uh, hopefully we'll accelerate those to see if we can procure one from Finland and use that to create uh, some space for startups in the utilization of that and see how we can uh, benefit the ecosystem with that. Thank you. Due to time constraint, we will not be able to entertain any more questions, sorry.